today we're going to talk a little bit about lipstick and the role it played in female rebellion and the revolution of female style and fashion. It is, I definitely call it the ultimate form of rebellion, red lipstick. It's not the ultimate form of rebellion, but it's one that we're going to talk about a little bit today. And it really plays into a lot of vintage style and a lot of ideas about vintage fashion that exists now. And we're going to talk a little bit about how it became the it look for pinup models and people in the 1950s and 1960s that we now associate with vintage style. And one of the first things we're going to talk about is um, you might think that lipstick has always been the embodiment of femininity or um, makeup that was used often. And it wasn't. And there's one simple reason for that, and that is because men did not want women to wear makeup, including lipstick, any kind of makeup. And we're not going to get deep into the history that goes further back, the ancient history of lipstick. We're going to stay closer to modern history when we discuss this, and mostly because I only have a limited memory <laughs> and time and attention span. Um, so we're going to talk more about recent time periods, 1900s and forward. But if you go back hundreds of years, centuries and centuries and centuries, you'll find that women were strongly discouraged from wearing makeup. Men did not want them to wear makeup. I'm sure there's a lot of different reasons why they passed down these dictates and why they tried to control things like eyeshadow and lipstick. Uh, but it really comes down to just that one word, control. Men wanted to control how women looked, they wanted to control how women presented themselves and how society viewed them. And so they kept makeup and specifically lipstick as this taboo thing that only women, like working women, women of the night would wear. So women in acceptable society didn't wear lipstick or makeup. So going back to even as far back as ancient Egypt, where men wore lipstick, women would as well, but they didn't wear it out of the house. It was okay to wear at home. It was not okay to wear on society. Um, you'll see that prostitutes were the only women in that time period who openly wore lipstick. And prostitutes actually had more power in those days than the average woman. And that's, to me, very telling that these women who were a, away from polite society wore lipstick publicly, wore it all of the time as this power grab, as this way of saying, you can't control me, no man controls me, I'm going to wear lipstick. Which is incredibly impressive if you think about the fact that men have been the dominant rulers and the dominant rule makers in society for so long. But you don't really see women, the average woman, wearing lipstick on a daily basis or even for dress up occasions until the 1900s. In 1912, the suffragettes took to the streets of New York wearing a bold red lip as a protest to men controlling their styles and their values and their ability to dress and act and be who they wanted to be. And that was the beginning of women wearing lipstick on the streets. So it was still during that time period, the women that were wearing it were still not the average woman. I wouldn't say that women who were still homemakers um, content in that role felt comfortable wearing lipstick, whereas suffragettes were more um, rebellious women who were openly protesting the patriarchal system that had been in place for so long. It wasn't until the 1920s with the popularity of the motion pictures that lipstick became a little bit more normalized. And makeup was used in movies for what to us feel like very common sense reasons now, but so that women's features stood out. Um, especially in black and white movies, women's features just kind of became blended in. And so they had to use very dark, very heavy lipstick and eyeshadow and eyeliner to make their features stand out. So this dark, deep, rich red lipstick was used all of the time. And because of this, in the 1920s, you saw 
more women going and buying lipstick and wearing it because it had become normalized by their by stars by their heroes and heroines in tv and movies in 1933 vogue declared lipstick the must have makeup item for women vogue has been i would say that vogue is a style maker still to this day vogue is still impacting what we consider to be fashionable and stylish but it was more so back in that day when before um instagram influencers and uh, before there were so many different magazines about style vogue was the magazine about style and vogue had declared it this must have cosmetic item and so even though it was the great depression and everybody was struggling with money and people were really cutting back and you know that that was the era of the feed sack dress because poor women would take these patterned feed sacks and turn them into dresses because everybody was so poor you couldn't go out and buy new dresses anymore and yet women were still buying lipstick because Vogue said it was the must-have item so you saw this look um especially if you look at authentic 1930s style women wore lipstick but you didn't see eyeshadow you didn't see eyeliner you didn't see blush on them really except that back in the day that lipstick worked as your blush as well so you would just take a little bit and rub it on your cheeks and you would use it both ways so lipstick kind of became this all-around product that was a frivolous small item that women were still purchasing even during time periods when money was tight and when cutbacks were common when women were doing things like drawing seams on the back of their legs to imitate the look of seamed tights without having to purchase those tights. Um, experts called this later the lipstick effect. It was why cosmetic companies stayed afloat during the Great Depression, and it was also why lipstick didn't fall back out of vogue, why lipstick carried on into the 1940s as a common thing for women to wear, even though even then, men didn't really want women wearing makeup very much. So that leads us into the 1940s, World War II. The entire globe was at war, and sacrifice was common again. We had gone from the 1930s, where financially people had to make these sacrifices, to the 1940s, where you made those sacrifices because we were at war, and everything was rationed, and all of the men were gone to war, and women were leaving the houses for the first time and working in factories to produce the products that were needed for the war to continue. It was during this time period that cosmetic companies released these politically charged ads wherein they phrased their lipstick as a way of supporting the war and the soldiers. So they produced a color called Victory Red. And this was the classic red. When you think about 1950s, 1940s, those bold red lips, that's what that color was, that victory red color. It was actually in 1941 when Elizabeth Arden produced victory red. And they put out this brilliant advertising campaign wherein they advertised it as a way of supporting the war. So you bought this lipstick, you wore this lipstick, it was patriotic to wear this lipstick, you were doing it for the boys, you were doing it for the war effort. So once again, even in a time period where everybody had to tighten their belts, where people went without regular items, even sugar and flour were scarce, women still bought lipstick. They still wore lipstick because it was patriotic, because you were doing it for the boys. And if you think about it, this is pretty brilliant marketing. I also want to touch on the fact a little bit that up until the 1900s, lipstick was forbidden by men. They didn't want women to wear it. But these ad campaigns, make no doubt about it, men were writing these ad campaigns. Women were not writing these ad campaigns. Men who were running cosmetic companies and who were the ad execs had to think of a way to keep women buying lipstick. So suddenly their focus shifted because, ding, 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 money. I don't want to like get too far away from that initial I love this suffragettes wearing it as this rebellion act but it's important to note here that men were definitely writing those ads men were the ones 
pushing lipstick at this point on women a little bit. So one cosmetic company was even quoted as saying, no lipstick will ever win a war. But, and I'm quoting here, it symbolizes one of the reasons why we're fighting, the precious right of women to be feminine and lovely under any circumstances. Um, so they recognized what they were doing, that it wasn't really helping the war effort, but it was about amping up this patriotic fervor in our country, which carries on to this day. Rebel and Fire and Ice campaign began in 1952 as one of the most effective ad, ad campaigns of all time. It made the most money for Revlon that any cosmetic ad campaign has ever made for a cosmetic company before. And Revlon became the company for red lipstick. To this day, they still produce dozens and dozens of types of red lipstick in different names, and they stick pretty close to their original formula, and they occasionally bring back those original styles and colors that they produced in the Fire and Ice campaign. And that is when red lipstick stopped being a patriotic thing and became this um, symbol of sexuality again, which is what we saw in previous centuries was that red lipstick was considered this sign of a sex pot. You know, the prostitutes wore it, or the very sexy women, the movie stars and starlets wore it. And then in the 40s, women wearing it to be patriotic, everybody wore it. But it became more about embodying a certain type of woman when you wore red lipstick. And that's when we think about the 1950s, we think about Marilyn Monroe with her red lip. We think about Jane Mansfield and her red lip. It became this sex symbol in the 1950s. Um, and you got to think, my mom did a pretty good job with that ad campaign because I think to this day we still think of a bold red lip as a pinup style, as um, this overly sexualized, very vintage, um, very bold, sensual style. And it's all thank you to Revlon's ad campaign. Over 70, 80 years ago, they came up with this ad campaign. And one of the things they did is they would run these two page ads and they had like questionnaires. And you'd fill out these questionnaires and it was questions asking if you were, basically you would answer these questions to see if you could pull off the look. Can you wear the bold red lip that Revlon is putting out? And there were questions like, do you ever dance without your shoes on? You know, how wild and crazy do you get? Are you, do you go outside of societal norms a little? Um, questions like, do you think that you're a, an independent woman and that men can't really tell you how to live your life? And women would fill out these questionnaires and get matched with the shade of lipstick that they should wear. And if you answered yes to all the questions like, do you dance barefoot? Do you, are you a strong, independent woman? They would say, you should wear red lipstick. And it became this thing that women want it to be, where in the past, women didn't necessarily want to be seen as rebellious. Most women didn't want to be seen as rebellious. Um, it became, it was like the birth of the manic pixie dream girl, if you will. This idea that okay, it was sexy to be a little rebellious and this red lipstick could be your way of being a little rebellious and also putting a little bit of money in Revlon's pocket while you're at it. From there, you really saw the normalization of makeup on women. It was no longer this outrageous thing for a woman to wear makeup in public or for the regular housewife to wear lipstick or eyeshadow or eyeliner, things like that. So I guess we have to thank companies like Elizabeth Arden and Revlon for making makeup normal and acceptable for anybody to wear. And I'm not just talking about women. Anybody can wear makeup. It's fun. You should try it. It's fun. If you are a person who dances with no shoes on <laughs> um, and you would like to capture that bold red lip that's very common in the 1950s, um, you can actually buy a reproduction of the original Elizabeth Arden Victory Red color. And it is by a company called Besame, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and they only do retro and reproduction makeup, and they have such things as cake liner and cake mascara still, which is what women used back in the day before it became in a tube. Um, and they have recreated this lovely shade of Victory Red, which I'm gonna show you here. 
And this is a pretty faithful recreation of the uh, original Victory Red. And they have beautiful packaging and designs. So you can still have that color that was used in the 1950s if that's something you want. I'm wearing it right now. It is a color I really like. Um, their lipstick is, it smells nice. It's very smooth going on. Um, so Besame's not paying me to advertise this or anything. I just thought that it kind of was interesting to know that you could still purchase this and you could still wear this color if you were interested in it. Um, so that is a little history of Victory Red lipstick. And um, I hope you enjoyed it. Leave me a comment of something else that you'd be interested in hearing about. And I will hopefully be doing additional videos in the future talking about style through the years or rebellious style, things like that. Um, and I think Ellen suggested this video maybe. So thank you Ellen for that. And have a great day guys. And 